um, well, you, you said know. you said in uh, my father made a tremendous sacrifice when he left a company that he spent his entire life building sure. to go into politics. Sure. Politics has drawn the spotlight, for instance, yeah. Deutsche Bank is being sued by the House um, Financial Services Committee, House Intelligence. They want your dad's tax returns. They want the Trump Organization's tax returns. How difficult does it make it for you to do business? Well, listen, it's different. There's a lot of distractions out there. There's a lot of distractions out in the world, and it's, um, you know, it's crazy. You, you see a, I always thought that New York real estate was the most cutthroat, toughest industry. It, it pales in comparison to politics. I mean, the evil out there, you have a lot of people out there. And, you know, it's interesting. If you look at, if you look at business, people want to, you can have two totally different people from two totally different walks of life. You could have, let, let's use Ted Cruz and Bernie Sanders, just as a comparison, right? And in New York, they'll be best friends. They'll be best friends because they'll have one goal in mind, and that's to build the greatest company or to develop the greatest widget or, you know, um, make the most money or develop something that's incredible or really emphasize an idea and go out and get it marketed and do something great. In politics, the financial component's not there, right? Well, to some of them it is, but to a lot of people in, fin in, or in politics, the financial component's not there. So what really motivates people in politics is oftentimes greed. And you walk the, the halls of Capitol Hill, I mean, look at Biden. Biden has been in politics longer than I've been alive. It's actually exactly 50 years and I'm 36, right? So he's exponentially longer than I've been alive. But you have a lot of people who are motivated in Washington, D.C. very differently than all of you are motivated here in New York, and it creates, it creates an evilness because they're fighting for power. They're not fighting for money. They're not fighting to build something that's a unique idea. They're not trying to make themselves better. They're fighting to retain power, and it's something that we had never come across as a family before. We had always been on the opposite side. We had always been on the capitalistic side. How do you build the best apartment? How do you design the best hotel? How do you build something on time, under budget? And all of a sudden, you go to the halls of Washington where you know people for the first time are sitting in these white marble offices overlooking Pennsylvania Avenue and they never want to leave. I mean, they hit the, they hit the jackpot and they never want to leave. But why the, why the criticism of Joe Biden and Hunter Biden and not Mitch McConnell? Mitch McConnell was a Democrat who became a Republican and has been sure. there hey. for almost 30 years. Hey, hey, criticize, and I'm not saying that. I, I listen, I think, it's, I think it's systematic in politics. I, I, I'm, I'm one person who would love to see term limits be in there, and I hope they're getting post tomorrow, quite frankly. But no, I think that can be the case. Um, I think that can be the case. I just think, I think money has corrupted politics in a big way. You see a lot of very shady things happening, and I think it's, um, I think it's very, very sad. You, you brought up money in politics, sure. and I have to ask, because of the current headlines, sure. whether it be Turkey, whether it be Ukraine, yeah. how does that impact your ability to do what you have to do? Because you brief your father, don't you, every quarter on the results of the business? No, not really. Uh, he's got uh, you know, far bigger things to worry about, and he trusts me implicitly, so I really don't. Um, I think, um, listen, headlines are headlines. Are headlines headlines are, are, are interesting, right? I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, you do see what's happening. I, I see a kid, and I don't want to get overly political right now, but, you know, we gave up our business when my father got into politics. We, we went out, and we voluntarily stood out. I, I mean, I've spent my whole life, meaning my business life, building hotels and golf courses and other things and doing that and growing them around the world, and we did so very, very well. The second my father looked like he was going to win, we went and we turned off every single deal that we were doing overseas that wasn't already like inked. Remember, this is what we do every single day. And we said, listen, while he's in there, we're not going to do anything. We're not sitting on boards. We're not giving speeches overseas. We're not, you know, we're certainly not doing projects over there. We actually turned off the business and it probably cost us hundreds of millions, billions of dollars to do that. The difference is in so many situations of politics, people are getting into politics and then everybody's milking the hell out of it um, to line their own pockets. And you know, this morning I, I went on and I looked up the average salary of a board member of ExxonMobil, 330,000 bucks. Average salary to sit on the board of ExxonMobil, which is like the second or third or fourth largest energy company in the world. You have Hunter Biden who made $600,000 a year, $50,000 a month, $600,000 a year to sit on the board of an energy company, a little energy company out of the Ukraine. And what, what do people really think is happening there? I mean, the average salary, yearly salary in the Ukraine is 1700 bucks, 1700 bucks a year in the Ukraine. And this kid who had plenty of problems is getting paid $600,000 to sit on a board exponentially more than board members of ExxonMobil. And money has corrupted politics and I think it's a shame and something has to be done about it. Well, when you bring up Hunter Biden, um, you know, you went there. So I've got a quote to you and this was from Yuri Litsenko, who is the prosecutor who was after 
Joe Biden and the, the previous prosecutor was Victor Shokin, but he said to Bloomberg News, May 2019, before the current whistleblower scandal and the Ukraine scandal were in the headlines, quote, Hunter Biden cannot be responsible for violations of the management of Burisma that took place two years before his arrival. So if that's the case, this is the man that Rudy Giuliani is basing his efforts uh, to gin up dirt with Ukraine. If that's the case, that prosecutor says Biden did nothing wrong. What's the business that your father's after? You know, the huge irony of, of the whole thing is when you have, when you have a son of, of a top politician of the US sitting on the board of a company getting paid $600,000 a year with no understanding of the language, no understanding of the industry at hand and, and no discernible duties, I think Americans, I think probably everybody in this room being in, this, in the real world, um, I think you probably look through it and say, come on, give me a break. You know, something fishy is happening here. When you have Nancy Pelosi's son who's sitting on the board of energy companies, right, while Nancy Pelosi actively goes out every single day, you can't drill for oil in upstate New York, totally fine, right? But you can't drill for oil in upstate New York, you can't frack, but it sure is hell okay if, if my son sits on an energy company, on the board of an energy company in Ukraine, I think people find that pretty hypocritical. And all I'm saying is, I think if you look at our family, and, and whether you're, guys, I'm, I'm actually probably a lot more centrist than, than everybody would otherwise surmise, you know, seeing us on, on TV. I, I, in all fairness, I was born in New York, but I think we'll go down as one of the few families that have actually made a tremendous sacrifice getting into business. We've lost a lot of money, I'm sorry, into politics. We've lost a lot of money based on the fact that we don't do any deals that we're sitting silent you know, while he's in there, that we're not sitting on boards, we're not doing what all these other people are doing. And I think there's a lot of people on the opposite side of the table who are, you know, their parents get in or they get in and all of a sudden, you know, listen, how is Nancy Pelosi worth the amount of money that she's worth if she's been in government for the last well, let me ask you this. long period of time? And it, it, what I'm saying is there's, there's a lot of dirty money in politics and I think people need to realize that and I pe think people are finally starting to see through it. And, and that has to change in this You country. bring up the issue of conflict of interest. Um, set the record straight for us. The Industrial and Commercial Bank of China was a client of Trump Tower, moved its entire, this is one of the largest banks in the world, moving its entire operations to Sixth Avenue here in New York City, but apparently renewed a lease for $2 million a year at Trump Organization within Trump Tower. So we have, Set the record straight. Why is know, that not a conflict of interest? We, we have the Industrial Bank of China in, uh, in one of our buildings, in, in Trump Tower actually, they're not too far away from me. Um, they signed a lease in 2009 or 2010. It expired October of this year, right? Yeah, with, with two five-year extensions, which they could renew at their option. So, you know, here's the problem with a lot of media, and I'm, I'm not, Adam, I'm certainly not saying No, no, you and I get along, but no, no, I'm trying to understand way, why it's not a conflict of interest, because you're, look, the, look, the, the I, president's meeting right can, now can I, can, I explain, can I explain to you? Yeah. If you sign a lease, is anybody in commercial real estate in New York in here? or just in real estate in general? I'm, I'm sure you have real estate people in here. If you sign a lease, say in 2010, and it's a 20-year lease, or say it's a 10-year lease, and it expires this year, but a company has two rights to renew at their option, which is like a very standard term in many contracts, right? You have a right to renew. You can't just tell them, you know what, guys? How about this? How about you get out of my... So, so, but they're moving, they're moving their operation to Sixth Avenue. We talked about, how would you explain this? I mentioned to you, I was on the campaign trail in Florida, followed your dad and Hillary Clinton in 2016, and I never forget the man I met inside the pickup truck. He was a farmer. And he said to me, Adam, I'm not a high school graduate, I'm not educated, but I'm not dumb. How do you explain to him that the largest bank in the world, a Chinese bank, and we're negotiating as a government, with, uh, with the Chinese government, and the Chinese government owns the majority stake of this bank, just paid the president's organization $2 million, and they're moving everything else to Sixth Avenue. They could have, wh why would they renew the lease if everything's going to Sixth Avenue, if well, they're not trying to get influence? Well, well they're keeping a couple floors, um, because they have, Adam, I don't know what else to tell you. If you have an option, I can't kick a tenant out of a building who has a binding lease that was done in 2010, it, it's actually like an asinine assertion. It's, it's crazy, like you couldn't, if you, have a, if you have an apartment lease for 12 months and you decide you want out of it tomorrow and, and you have nine months left on that lease, you can't just go up to your landlord and say, congratulations, Mr. Landlord, I no longer want, I'm not gonna pay. You know what they do? They come back and they sue you for that. We had a binding lease that was a long-term lease. When, 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 you, when you do office floors, right, you're, you're doing 20-year leases, you're doing 15-year leases, maybe you're doing a 10-year lease, but you have a tenant in a building for a very long time. You can't just throw them out. What am I gonna do? They show up in the middle of the night, I'm gonna lock their doors and, you know, dear Mr. Tenant, you can no longer go into your, 
it's an, it's an asinine assertion. Hello investors, I'm Zach Guzman. Thank you so much for checking out the Yahoo Finance YouTube channel. Don't forget to click right here to subscribe and don't forget to check out our live market coverage every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern time right here on the Yahoo Finance YouTube channel.